morning, the Stuff Jesus Says series continues. The words of Jesus, the words in red, are so important as followers of Jesus, as followers of Christ. We have to understand, know, understand, and comprehend what he said, what he taught, what he believed. One of the ways we learn from the words of Jesus is by reading his prayers. We have a few of his prayers uh, recorded in the Gospels. And when we think about a prayer that uh, Jesus prayed, most people would probably think of that most famous prayer, right? The Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven. But I think that the best recorded prayer of Jesus is actually in John chapter 17. So that's where we're going to turn this morning. It's sometimes called the High Priestly Prayer. Now the sermon this morning is going to be a little bit different. I usually um, kind of do a, a mix between a topical and an exegetical sermon. Um, this morning it's a pure exegetical sermon. And that means I'm going to be going line by line through the passages of Scripture and preaching exactly what the Scripture teaches. And, uh, and uh, I just thought, you know, and forgive me if I get emotional, I've been, a little, I've been having a hard time since yesterday morning, but I, I just thought that if, if John Jamer was here, he'd be saying amen, because he liked the exegetical <laughs> messages, he liked the biblical preaching, um, and uh, so I, I think this would have been honoring, this is honoring to him as well. So the setting of John chapter 17, let's set this up a little bit. Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry. For about three years, uh, he had been traveling, teaching, going all over Israel, uh, performing miracles and whatnot. And now this is all wrapping up, uh, coming to a close. It's the night of Passover. He's had the Last Supper with the disciples. Judas ran off to go and make his deal with the Sanhedrin. And now Jesus and the eleven remaining disciples have gone out for a walk towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they walk, Jesus is teaching them, Let not your hearts be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Helper, the Holy Spirit is coming. I am the vine, you are the branches. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. All of these wonderful teachings that he teaches in this walk to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, after all of this incredible teaching, we come to John chapter 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. So we're going to work through this bit by bit. We're going to be starting this talk. When Jesus had spoken these words, after he had said all these things, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. This was a normal posture for Jewish prayer. So we're used to hands folded, eyes closed, heads bowed. A normal Jew posture for Jewish prayer was hands raised, eyes open to heaven, speaking out loud. So different than what we're used to. That's what Jesus was doing. That's what the disciples would have heard. And he said, Father, the hour has come. What hour was he talking about? He was talking about the hour of his death. The, all the events, the passion of the Christ that would lead to his death, his arrest, his false trial, his death on the cross, and then his resurrection. The hour has come. My earthly ministry is wrapping up. And then he prays his first prayer request in his prayer. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Glorify the Son, so that the Son may glorify you. So his prayer is, as I go through all that I am about to go through, glorify me, O God. Now, we wouldn't really think of the cross and, and, and the brutality of that as something glorious, right? It was gory, it was horrific, it was painful. And yet the death of Christ was Glorious! It brought glory to the Son and glory to God. It's hard to explain, but through the Bible we see this recurring theme of glory through suffering. Or as, as Paul said just a few minutes ago, through weakness, the same idea. Glory through weakness, glory through suffering. When I think about some of the happiest, most beautiful moments of my life, um, there's, there's something that makes the top five, for sure. And that's the birth of my children. Right? Like, I just think back to those moments, um, and they were filled with inexpressible joy when my children were born. They were moments of glory and joy and beauty, but they were also moments of suffering, right? 
Great suffering. Julia suffered. Each baby, as they were born, experienced trauma. My hands felt crippling pain. Still crippling pain. Um, glory through suffering, right? Glory through suffering. And that's a great description of the cross. The Son glorifies the Father through His obedience in suffering for the sins of man. The Father glorifies the Son in accepting His sacrificial death as the atonement for the sins of man. So Jesus prays, glorify your Son as He looks ahead to the cross. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Then he says, since you have given him, and he's talking third person, so he's talking about himself. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, Jesus is the king. He has authority over all mankind. That's what Jesus says. Believe it or not, this Jewish man who lived in Israel 2,000 years ago was and is God, the creator of the universe. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, I love this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I love that. So Jesus has authority over all flesh. Isaiah chapter 9, this prophecy of Jesus, we usually hear this at Christmas, right? Um, that he will be the Prince of Peace, the mighty Father, the everlasting Father, the whatnot. And it says the government will be on his Shoulder. I love that little bit of prophecy because what that says is that is that uh, one day he is going to have that earthly authority. On the day of his death, he carried a cross on his shoulders, but on the day of his return, he will carry the government of the whole world on his shoulders. Jesus, as God, is the supreme authority, and one day will manifest that supreme authority when his kingdom is fully realized. Jesus was very clear in his own identity. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the authority of all mankind. No question. We see that over and over again. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, verse 2, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Because of that authority that Jesus has, he has the power to give eternal life. Wow. He has the power to give eternal life. To whom? To everyone who believes. Yes. Everyone who repents of their sin and turns to Christ in faith. Yes. But I like how Jesus how Jesus uh, phrases it here. Uh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. To those the Father gave him. He's thinking about those 11 disciples God gave him. All the other disciples God gave him. And beyond that, as we'll see later in this prayer, uh, all the followers of Jesus who have ever lived throughout time, including us, God gave these people to Jesus, who in turn gave them eternal life. Now let me, I want to say something here. I am not a Calvinist, okay? So I want to put that on the table. Some of you may be Calvinists or may lean in that direction. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe in salvation only for the elect. I don't believe in limited atonement, that Jesus only died for the people whom God chose and everyone else is the top block. I don't believe that. I believe salvation is a real possibility for anyone. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever believeth in the name shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I remember hearing a great old Baptist preacher one time say, and whosoever means whosoever. <laughs> <laughs> and actually John James used to say that too. So whosoever means whosoever. But what Jesus prays here reminds us that even the faith that we have to believe in Christ is a gift from God. Right, like Ephesians 2, 89 says, right, that for by grace are we saved through faith, and even that's not of ourselves. That's a gift from God, too. The faith to believe is a gift from God. John Wesley, who I highly respect, the founder of the Wesleyan Church, um, and others call this grace prevenient grace, or enabling grace. It's the grace that enables us to believe. Here's what Wesley says. Prevenient grace elicits the first wish to please God. The first dawn of light concerning his will, and the first slight transient conviction of having sinned against him. So God, the Holy Spirit, draws us to Jesus, so we can have the opportunity to choose him or reject him. That's prevenient grace, or enabling grace. 
without that grace of God, we wouldn't be able to be saved. So all of us here this morning, if you are a Christian, and all Christians who've ever lived through time have thus been given to Jesus by the Father as He prayed. And we have eternal life. That's the theme of the whole Gospel of John. And then Jesus in His prayer explains what eternal life is. I love this definition of eternal life. This is so cool. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life equals knowing God. Eternal life equals knowing Jesus. Eternal life is not heaven. Okay, I, I want to make that clear. So sometimes we think about, you know, eternal life means heaven, right? Well, heaven is the place your eternal life continues after you die. It's not eternal life. Eternal life is the condition of knowing God. Eternal life is the state of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Father, the Holy Spirit. That's eternal life. It's knowing God and His Son, Jesus. Wow. That's what it means to truly live. That's what it means to live forever, is to know God. And so when we die, it's that relationship that we've started with God, at the moment of salvation, just continues for eternity. It's eternal life. It doesn't get cut off when we die. Eternal life is to know God. And not just any old God, but the only true God, Jesus says. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. We had youth group on Friday, first youth group of the year. I think we had about 15 youth. Oh, it was really encouraging. You were excited that kind of pick up where we left off at the end of last year. You're always worried when you start up again that you're going to lose a few, but we, we didn't, so that was encouraging. And, and uh, Anyway, at Youth Group, we had a great discussion. There was all kinds of questions, and one of the things that came up in our discussion was um, all these different uh, beliefs that their friends have about all kinds of different things. Reincarnation, and, 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 and so on and so forth, with ghosts and stuff. Like, and so people were asking all these kinds of questions, right? Like, well, what is, is reincarnation real or ghost real? Da, 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 da. And it reminded me that out in the world today, we are faced with a myriad of differing views, spiritual perspectives, religious views, things that have been mixed together. Um, and, 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 and it's kind of like there's a spiritual buffet out there in our culture today, especially for young people, right? And so it's like, you just sort of go up to the buffet and say, well, I like this little bit of uh, meditation here from, from this Eastern religion, and I think, oh, Jesus is a good person. I'll, I'll take a little bit of Jesus, and, and uh, I'll take a little bit of uh, reincarnation from Hinduism or whatever, and, and, and I'll take, oh, this uh, native spirituality traditionalism thing is, is kind of interesting to me. I'll take some of that, and, and, and blend it all together, and you kind of build your own plate of religion, and that's what we kind of face up there. And so it's very hard for young people especially, to know what is true. And, and I think it's very important that we lead people towards the truth, and truth matters. And I want to know what's true and spend my life pursuing that, not just some made-up thing that I think makes me feel good. I want to know what the truth is. And so the Word is truth, for one thing. We, need, we know that. And we also know that, as Jesus says, there is only one true God. Jesus reminds us, God, you are the only true God. God, not one option of many acceptable selections. The only, the only true God. It's important that we get that in our minds. And as we'll see in coming messages in this own prayer, Jesus says, your word is truth. The word of God is our guiding principle of what is true. God is the creator. The God Jesus was praying to, the God of the Bible. He's the one and only true God, the creator of the universe, there is no other. So Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Then he says, verse 4, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was sent on a mission to earth by God the Father. His mission started with Christmas. Not December 25th, but some other day of the year. But he was born, and that was, began that mission. Well, actually, probably the conception, the Immaculate Conception started. The, the, but anyway, uh, when he was born, that's Christmas, and then he, he lived this life, 
this ministry uh, that he had for three years, serving people, as I said, whatnot, teaching. And then Good Friday came when he was crucified, then Easter when he rose from the grave, and then 40 days later, the ascension, he went back to heaven. This was his earthly ministry. This was his mission on earth. This was the plan of salvation, that people would be saved from their sins because of the atoning death of Christ on the cross. And he was now about to complete the work. The cross, the empty tomb, and, and the, re the resurrection appearances and all that stuff would be the last steps. So he's nearing the end. He says, God, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, in perfectly obeying the Father, Accomplishing the mission without fail, Jesus has brought glory to the Father on earth and glorified you on earth. And then prayer request number two. So prayer request number one was glorify me through the cross as I glorify you through the cross and what, what's going to come there. And then prayer request number two is similar. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before. Before the world existed. Wow. There is so much cool stuff wrapped up in that little verse. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. This is a request for the Father to restore the glory the Son had in the Father's presence before his mission on earth began, even before creation of the universe. Meaning Jesus is pre-existent. Jesus is God, Jesus is part of the triune God that had existed outside of creation before the universe ever existed. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. Jesus is now thinking beyond the cross, beyond the empty tomb, and looking ahead to his ascension when he would return to heaven, return to that close, intimate relationship he had with God. Father, I've completed the mission. Now bring me back. I want to come home. I remember uh, one, of, one of my favorite Canadian, Chris Hadfield. You know who Chris Hadfield is, right? He's the astronaut. He's, he's probably my favorite Canadian. I love Chris Hadfield. I read his book, The Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Um, I remember my favorite Canadian, Chris Hadfield, was commanding the International Space Station. There he is up in space, singing David Bowie. Um, <laughs> Ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> I love that song. I don't know if any David Bowie fans here, but I like the David, David Bowie's version. He says, Floating in the most peculiar way. Oh, <laughs> such a funny way he says that. Anyway, I love David Bowie. Weird guy, but good music. Um, anyway, when, when um, Chris Hadfield was in space, in the International Space Station, he did not lose contact with the Earth. In fact, he was the most communicative astronaut in the history of astronauts. He was tweeting all the time, he was doing live video feed stuff at schools, he was uh, performing with the Bare Naked Ladies, uh, the band, uh, and uh, <laughs> doing talk shows, uh, all these things, talking to his family, um, making videos, it was really cool. His communication with people back on Earth still existed, but it wasn't the same as being home, right? It was not the same as being home. And when he got home from his mission, and was reunited in person with his wife and family. That relationship was so was that much more intimate and special and tangible, right? And so I think this is sort of like what Jesus experienced when he came to earth, right? He came to earth, he left behind a certain level of intimacy with the Father. He still had communication with the Father, he prayed to the Father, there was still a close connection there. But he sacrificed somehow, in some mysterious way, some of that relationship, some of that intimacy with the Father. He shed some of his glory to take on flesh. Remember when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples saw him and it was like, wow, he was like shining and there was like prophets of old and gathered around and they were like just stunned because Jesus like was showing glory. Like, I think that's what the glory of Jesus looked like, like in heaven, right? And so he shed some of that to take on flesh. Uh, and, now he, and, and, and now he's praying, God, I'm ready to come home and get back my glory. I'm ready to, to, to come home and get back in that intimate relationship with the Trinity that, we, that I had before I left. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. Now to wrap up this first section, Jesus gives another report to the Father about the success of his earthly ministry. Verses 6 to 8. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. 
Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. And he's drawing a contrast there to those who saw Jesus, witnessed Jesus, but thought he was evil, thought he was demon-possessed, thought he was working in league with the Satan. The disciples truly understood who he was. The true disciples truly believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He says, now they know that everything you have given me is from you, it's from God, from the Father. For you have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Next week, we're going to look at this, continue looking at this prayer. Jesus prays for us, the church. And what does he pray? Wow, it's important. Really important what Jesus prays for his church. But to close, two simple questions for you this morning. Two takeaways, two things for you to reflect on. First of all, to everyone, do you count yourself among those who have, as Jesus said, received the words of Jesus, come to know the truth that he came from God, and have believed in him? Meaning, have you received Christ? Have you trusted in Christ? become one of his disciples. I know most of you personally, and I know most of you have, and I thank God for that. Some of you, I'm sure, still have not. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time and you still don't really believe, or maybe you're just in a zone where you're searching or questioning or, or curious, seeking, whatever it might be. I just want to challenge you, encourage you. God may be drawing you this morning, the prevenient grace of God, the enabling grace of God may be speaking to your heart this morning and saying, today is your moment. You need to trust in Christ. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He's calling you to become a disciple. Respond with yes. Respond with yes, Lord. I surrender. I give in. I raise the white flag. Take me on yours. Pray for repentance of your sin, forgiveness of your sin, and follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. Question number two to the Christians this morning. Jesus was able to report to the Father, I glorify you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Will you be able to give God the same report at the end of your life? When your time on earth is coming to a close, will you be able to say to the Father, I glorify you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do? He has work for you to do. He has a mission for you. Just as he had a mission for Jesus. In fact, in this prayer later on, Jesus prays, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. We have the same mission as Jesus. To love people, to care for people, to meet needs, to preach the word, to tell people the truth about who Jesus is, to bring good news. So this morning, a loving reminder that our Savior has shown us by example how we glorify God on earth. And a challenge to you to join God in what He is doing in our church, in our communities, and in your new world. I loved this vision that Paul mentioned a little bit this morning, this new kind of focus of our, of our denomination. It's, uh, will you join God in changing Atlantic Canada one neighborhood at a time? That's the question, that's the challenge, and it's the same challenge for you. Will you be able to say, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do? You know, <laughs> it's been mentioned a few times this morning, but John Jamer, wow, here is a man of God. We can look to John Jamer in this church as a man who could say, at the end of his life, with all sincerity, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. May it be true of us as well. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, as we read your word this morning, our eyes are illuminated to your glory. Oh, Lord, your eyes.
awesome. You're everything. Thank you, God, that you were so willing to humble yourself, to shed some of that glory and intimacy with the Father to come so that you could lift us up from our sin, dust us off, and give us new life with you, eternal life. Thank you for that amazing privilege and gift. Lord, I pray for those this morning who may be here that have never accepted that gift in their own life, have never accepted Christ, have never truly come to that place of, of saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I want what you have to offer. I want that relationship. Forgive me of my sins. So I pray this morning, God, that even if there's one person here this morning that is in that place, that feels that tug of the Holy Spirit, I pray that today they would surrender in their hearts and start on this exciting journey of following you. And Lord, for those of us who are here, who are your disciples, remind us of this challenge this morning. Lord, we want to honor you. We want to glorify you on earth. We want to accomplish the work that you gave us to do. So, Lord, use us for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. We're going to close.